Welcome to LTTV Weekly, episode eight, I believe. We finally counted back and had a look and worked out exactly how many we have done during this lockdown period. I think I got a report in the other day that we've also had about more than 50,000 views across all of these. So certainly good to see that people are involved and interested and certainly good to my co-host, who I'll bring in now, that people want to hear what we have to say, Jordan Murphy. Yeah, well, I think it's mainly because we've had some good guests, Sam, to be quite honest with you. They don't really want to listen to me and you, but um, yeah, we'll take it. We'll take it. It's been a, uh, is it seven or eight? I'm not sure. Uh, it could be seven or eight. Who knows? Who knows? I said I knew. So now I've put myself out there. Let's hope it's eight. Geordie, okay. an interesting episode tonight. We talked about how good the guests have been because tonight we don't have one. Now, that's not necessarily down to not being able to get one. It's down to the fact that this week we've given some people some quite interesting content i think on wednesday evening in particular we offered up something that maybe no club's ever done before i I know certainly from your point of view i don't know how transparent other clubs have been in that level of a business yeah no it was it was a really interesting one um obviously to have uh, the ceo the chairman and and the financial chief financial officer on board along with jan and myself was a um star studded not including myself Um, but yeah, the transparency was really important. Um, you know, I, I think um, all of the feedback that I've had from friends and, and family on in regards to it have been, they didn't think that we would be as open as, as we have been as a club. Um, pretty much laid it bare. I thought Andrea w- was was incredibly honest. Uh, I thought the chairman was was a, um, yeah, he was uh, pretty, particularly impressive as well in the way you know we, we've re- we've talked about how difficult these times are. And we've talked about how difficult it is for us as a club and, and how these decisions weigh on us. And, and um, it's not it's not pretty. It's not nice. But, um, you know, the, 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 the longevity of the club, I suppose, is paramount. I think what's important to note is that while tonight might end up more of a discussion between you and I, what's been interesting behind the scenes at Leicester and whether or not I'm saying too much is the club's recognised a need to be more transparent and the club's recognised a need, certainly in what has been an extremely frustrating time, an extremely hard time for fans and those inside the club, the need to try and share as much as you can without saying too much because of the amount of unknowns, you don't want to commit yourself to something that may change 24 hours later. So I guess from your point of view, I would imagine internally you guys have those struggles too because there's a lot of competitive sportsmen who want to get back out of the field and smash each other. And you can't promise them a day or a time for that. No, as you say, that, that's been one of the main problems of this pandemic. And, and we haven't been able to go to anyone for advice in it and that we've all been in a very similar situation. And we found out very early that it was a very changing landscape and, and um, we couldn't give people um, real clarity. Every time you, know, you went on a Zoom call, people would want to know answers and, and we didn't have the answers. So I suppose the natural thing to do is almost you know, shut up shop and, 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 and tr- try not to speculate. But I think sometimes that can be that can be poor as well. And until you have the, the, the hard, cold facts, it's, it's difficult to try and share speculation. But um, anytime there is a, a void, people will fill it with their own information. And, and so that, that's something that we've learned as well. So it's been important to try and be as transparent as possible. I think what's nice is that people have noticed it. But I think another point to acknowledge as well for anyone watching is that while you see speculation in the media and even as late as today, with the announcement that there is a hopeful date of return or commencement or recommencement, sorry, of the season, it still remains a proposal. It is not a confirmation that we will commence rugby. And I'm not putting a dampener on things because it is exciting news for rugby circles, but it, it remains a proposal because a lot needs to be done before we can get back on the pitch. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great point to make, you know, as in we're obviously conscious that we want to be back out there and, and to set a, a date of, of the 15th of August is, is a, uh, is, is a target that we're all aiming for. Um, as you said, you know, we're going to bring our players back in. The guys have been training um, at home and have been training very hard, but we're going to try and get them back in on Monday the 15th, and, and that will be the start of stage one. Um, we'll have our doctor on, I believe, next week, and we'll be able to go through the, the, the details of exactly how that looks. But like our chairman has said all along, it's, it's really important that we get it right, that we have our safety procedures in place and that we're protecting all of our uh, of our players and their families because you know we need to create a biosecure environment for our players to train at and make sure that they're a uh, they're safe um we will do that 
we will, we're confident we'll have that across the line for us to start training you know in a socially distanced manner um, which will be uh, not like sort of rugby training in the past and that you know we won't be coaching the guys it'll be just purely there um, helping them develop and, and put some weight on and, and a lot of players have lost a lot of weight throughout this uh, uh, this stay at home um, so we, we will uh, um, we'll support them for, for a, uh, as long as we can, we can until we go to stage two and, and, and exactly what stage two looks like is you know more traditional rugby training where we aspire to do some tackling and, and get bodies on and we'll have to have mauling and build that up slowly and that will take a, a period of time as well and, and, and again you know we don't want to be throwing players into premiership games of rugby if they haven't done the required amount of training and built that up to the right level. So um, it's, it's brilliant. We've got, we've got a, a, a target to go for it in the 15th of, of, of August. Um, all the guys, I'm sure, will be, will be keen to, to aim for that. But, you know, we have to make sure that we, we, we get it right and we have our people who are safe across the board, not just on the playing side of it. But again, you know, it's, it's important that, that, you know, the guys' families, uh, our staff are all safe and secure. As you said, next week, we, we're going to have Harjinder Singh on, the, the club doctor, who can, I think, as we said off air before, can provide a little bit more of the, maybe boring to some detail, but it will be quite fascinating to hear from him about exactly how much work's gone into making sure Oval Park's ready, how much is going to take place on a daily or even twice a day or weekly basis to play a game of rugby. But also what I think will be interesting for people is to hear about maybe the concerns of non-COVID related issues that might pop up because of those coming in underdone. And as you said a couple of weeks ago, you need that eight week period to get to there. Oh yeah, like, you know, we're conscious this is the longest that professional rugby players will have been without being at a training facility and I'm getting uh, quality training on board now. They've all been training hard. We know that the guys have been uh, actively engaged in, in doing uh, lots of training at home, but it's just very different. and and we're conscious that we can't control the intensity from away when they're away from there. So um, it's, it's, as I said, it's the longest they've, they've not trained as a group. Um, so it's important that we, um, we get them into a, a peak physical condition in order to play for premiership games. Um, it's going to create a stress on, on, on the bodies and on the team. And, and we don't know exactly what the, the premiership will look like upon return. We haven't had a, a detailed fixture list yet. Uh, and we don't know if we have to play midweek games yet. Um, but hopefully over the next few weeks, that will all become apparent and, and we can plan with some more detail. I guess one of the obvious questions people have had also is why try and recommence a season so close to when you'd scheduled for the next season to start? But I think to call a spade a spade and maybe answer it for you, I think in Wednesday night's chat, if you haven't seen it, I think there is a, to be brutally honest, financial element of having to get rugby back to see the survival of clubs. Yeah, look, it was something that we were very conscious that we wanted to do. People wanted to see this season completed. Uh, sponsors and, and, and they, uh, uh, people who are put, putting large sums of money into the clubs want to see the season finished. Um, the players want to finish the season as well. So it's a um, it's slightly a, uh, a difficult one to get people's heads around. And people sort of have often said to me, why don't we just cancel it? Um, we've gone down this route where we're going to finish it. And, and, and I think it's a... Um, I think it's, it's a good thing. Um, you know, we, we get to finish what we started. I want to ask you about Wednesday night's discussion, but also what that's been like for you, because while we stuck to the detail on Wednesday, I think without putting the pressure on you or necessarily making too big a deal out of it and not a woe me section, but the emotional strain that this has put on individuals, especially those at the top of the club, and I'm, I'm not necessarily just saying those people, but the emotional impact on everybody has been quite arduous, hasn't it? Yeah, it, it doesn't sit well with anyone. You know, we're in the, in the process of, of a uh, redundancies and you know, to have people's livelihoods in your hands is, is not, a, not a nice thing to, to have to take to bed with you in the evening. Um, you know, obviously, it's horrible news to have to, to, to deliver um, and it's horrible to news to have to take, um, you know, particularly in that I've been so impressed and at how people in the club have been um, completely all about the club. Um, everybody who we've spoken to have been um, totally aware of, of the situation that we're in and, and they've all talked about, um, you know, it not being a great situation, but just, you know, basically being totally supportive of, of seeing the club come, come through this in, in a positive place. And uh, I suppose um, that's probably been a, a tougher way, tougher thing to, to, 
to tough way to break news in that you know i'm talking to people who are really good people really quality staff and we're, we're talking about potential redundancies um and potential job losses and and, and they uh you know they're, they're still supportive of the club and still aware of where we're at and and you know to have such good people in our environment um and to have you know jobs at risk in, in times like this it doesn't sit well with anyone um it's it, it it weighs hard on everyone's shoulders and I suppose it weighs hardest on, on the people who, who've been notified. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's not a, a woe is me piece at all. It's not something that, that anybody who I know enjoys. Um, unfortunately, it, it's the way of the world and where we sit at the moment. You've been fortunate enough to be around Leicester for a long, long time and you've seen Leicester grow into, you know, at some points, the biggest club in the world. You know Leicester can grow from a very small amount of people. And while there will be losses, and that is absolutely heartbreaking because of the hard work that's gone on, there must be some part of you, to put a silver lining on it, that knows Leicester can bounce back from this and will bounce back from this. 100%. I've been here a very long time. This is my 23rd year. And you know, at times, we've been through tough periods. Um, we have struggled. Or we've struggled on the field. And, and hands down, that's been something for the, for the last few years. Um, but something that I'm very conscious that we will get right. Um, I have complete faith in, in the chairman and Peter Tom's love and how passionate he is about the club, that it's all about you know getting Leicester back in a stronger position than you know we went out of. And, and although we're in a tough spot at the moment and, and the, the world is in a tough spot, um, everything that we're doing and, and everything that, that the chairman is driving is, is about um, coming out as a force on the other side of it. You know, We talked on Wednesday about... Um, one of the reasons that that you know it's financially hit us so hard is because we have you know twenty four thousand fans at, at games and 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 that that a uh, revenue is 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 you know has propped us up when we don't have those amount of people coming through the gates it, it hits us um the flip side of that is when we get through the pandemic when we do get fans back on board um hopefully we'll get back up on our feet uh, very very quickly um, one of the big things that that you know we've has come out of even Wednesday's um, Wednesday's uh, LTTV chat was the amount of support and the support of emails that I've received from fans. Um, we really have the best fans in the world. Um, they follow us through thick and thin, and we've had some some amount of thin in the last few years. But still, um, Welford Road is one of the best stadiums for 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 a player to play in and for a fan to support in. And um, although we've we've come through tough times, the messages of support from the fans have been epic um and you know hopefully at some stage down the line we'll be able to be able to share some of those because they um just people who are having tough times and who are just totally behind the the, the team is a uh, is what we're all about i don't know if i'm being a little bit cheeky here but um i think even if social distancing measures are in place and we can only have half a stadium full we still might have more fans in there than other clubs so uh, maybe I've upset some other clubs by saying that, but I'm sure our fans will appreciate that. Look, it's, it's something that we're looking into and, and the chairman has, has talked about it. We don't know exactly how it's going to look um, when we do get back, whether we have to play behind closed doors. Um, something that we think, because of the size of Welford Road, we think that we can do is, is, is get fans in there, socially distanced, and, and we'd obviously have to come up with a really detailed plan on how that looks and, and, and a pretty uh, impressive one-way system but we have the space to get fans in there and um, we're very lucky to have a large amount of season ticket holders and it would be very nice to be able to reward them by by getting in and, and, and watching it and as you said one of, one of the most impressive things is the amount of noise that the fans have made this season in support of the team and, and uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons I say it's the best best club venue in the world to play. How are those conversations going with those guys we're expecting to see in Leicester colours training colours certainly from the 1st of July what have their conversations been like given that they will have seen all going on as well yeah look you know everyone's in the same boat a lot of guys coming from from overseas and, and coming from different clubs and, and they're all very excited to arrive and to really get stuck into training um, under the new coaching regime um, so some of those guys are, are in different different boats some are in the country already uh, and, and ready to a uh, ready to take the field and, and some guys are awaiting visas and, and are awaiting flights to, to get in and obviously the guys who come in from overseas will have to stand down for a couple of weeks and we'll, we'll have to uh, make sure that they're doing a quality of training in their uh, in their isolated pods um, but they're all completely supportive um, very very keen now to, to be on the ground especially with it with a start date 
uh, to work towards. Um, and they're excited. Um, you know, I think the guys who have joined the club are, are uh, conscious about uh, what you know they want to do and what they want to contribute. And, and they, um, it's a, certainly an exciting time. Obviously, as you say, a lot was put into place, which we've talked about over the last couple of months each week, is a lot was put into place pre-pandemic, you could say, in terms of making sure Leicester was on the right track. I think if you could, for fans out there, there's still certainly a lot to be excited about. The The train hasn't been derailed, has it? No, I don't think so. I think you know we're, we're still in a strong position. We had some fantastic plans and we, we still have those plans. We still aspire to to keep developing our academy and, and they, uh, keep bringing young players through. We believe we've signed some really quality players and there will be some more added who have already signed but um, we won't be announcing them just yet um, and um, yeah no it's uh, Lester and, and myself we've, we've got a um, plans on where we want to be and we're, we're aspirational we want to get back to the top of the ladder uh, there is no silver bullet um, there is no easy fix uh, you know we're conscious that it, it was the start of a journey I'm very very happy to have Alid and Steve on board and, and a, uh, Rob Taylor as well coming over from Australia and we believe in, in the coaching department that we've got a, a really strong team um, with the guys we already have and Mike, Boris and, and Brett and, and a, um, yeah, like the, the players coming in will, will, will certainly a, uh, be put through their paces and, and a, um, we'll be back on track. I think whether or not I'm taking your words and spinning them there but I, I guess one thing important to note because people have acknowledged it in recent days since the club announced that jobs will well, potentially face leaving the club. I guess one thing you're trying to acknowledge there is that while there might not be any recruitment going on in terms of staffing roles, those players that have signed and, and are sealed in for next season, that doesn't impact their place in the team. No, no, certainly that's, that's the case. You know, the guys who have signed, um, we are confident will be here contributing to the team from the 1st of July. Um, we put a, put a freeze on, on pretty much everything um, as of the start of, of the pandemic and, and a, um, we won't be looking to add anything that isn't already signed to our, a, uh, to our environment. I want to ask you about one more person or, or maybe two people actually, probably better put, in our environment because, um, and I'm treading carefully because I, I don't want to share my opinions maybe too much on this, but two members of our family, you could say, were came under fire this week a little bit with some comments from my neck of the woods down under. Um, Mike Ford and George Ford, to put it bluntly, I don't know if my opinion matters on this front, but certainly wasn't the assessment that I would give of two people that we value in our club. Yeah, look, it's really strange and it's come at a strange time, you know, to be dragging things up from five years ago. Um, I've known Mike Ford for a very long time. I've known George Ford for a very long time. Mike coached me as, as an Irish player. Um, he's been uh, through uh, the world of rugby. He's, he's incredibly experienced. He has been great for me uh, in my role in, in his support of me. Um, and George as well um, has been uh, incredible for, for Leicester um, throughout his entire career. Um, you know, he's, he's got a hell of a lot of caps. He's renowned as being a, a, an unbelievable team man. Um, so, um, yeah, to have uh, bits and pieces dragged is slightly confusing. Um, I'm certainly very confident that both of those guys are, are a, uh, you know, very, very well received at Leicester and, and they are doing a great job. So um, yeah, it's not really for me to, a, uh, to comment on, on, on that any, any more than to say that I am very happy with the two forwards. No, I, I, you know, again, you don't have to add to it, but I think when the club's worked as hard as it can to re-establish or, you know, add some new values but re-establish what it's about it, it certainly wouldn't be the case that two people who represented maybe what some people think uh, they wouldn't be involved in a club should we've thought they didn't represent those values so the fact that they are means they don't people always have opinions um and, and that's unfortunate that's that's life um you know i, I think uh, uh, for for whatever reason people say different things and, and they um you know we're just very, very, very happy to have both of the guys. We're very confident that they add to our environment. Um, you know, as I said, Mike, Mike's been a, um, great for me personally and a great support to me over, over the last uh, couple of seasons and, and, and longer. Um, known both guys a long time and, and they, uh, yeah, they're, they're uh, both good human beings. 
think they usually, the saying goes that you only get a sore neck from looking back, don't you? So there's no real point in doing that. Rugby league, do you ever consider a flip over there at any point? Uh, no, it didn't really suit my skill set. Um, wouldn't mind a, um, thinking, no, I, I obviously admire watching rugby league and I admire some of the, uh, some of the guys who play it. Um, very, very different sport. Uh, very, very different sport indeed to rugby union. Um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, there, there aren't very many players that, that make the jump between the two codes. Obviously, in the coming weeks, the kit launch will be coming out. You've seen the kit. You know what the kit looks like. But one part of the kit this year that fans will get to see is uh, somewhere on the kit, because I'm conscious of giving anything away here, because Chris Rose don't, will have... have don't my, give it away. Don't give it away. Neck. But somewhere on the kit, there's going to be some really distinct descriptive values of what the club's about. And while I don't want to go through them tonight in detail with you, because I think there's an element here, Pat Howard alluded to it when we spoke to him. I think there is an element here of getting Matt Johnson on to front up and explain the values and certainly Andrew Pynchon as well. But, you know, tough, driven, club first and passionate. Four things, five words that you certainly want to see your players next year showing each week. Yeah, I think, you know, that that's what... Um what I sort of the club that I came into certainly people can show different traits and people show it in different ways but I am certainly Leicester Tigers players you know should always be tough we should always be competitive and we should always be a uh, there at the uh, at the death um, we've talked already about you know people how passionate they are for this club and I saw um, Ian Smith in Dosser Smith's interview uh, earlier and you know a guy like that I suppose typifies passion um, to hear him speak about the club um, just really makes the hairs on, on anybody, any players next stand and, and fans and, you know, his love of the club and, and how much it means to him is, is, a, is inspiring. And, and, you know, I suppose that just flows down and we, we need to get that in throughout the whole club, not just on, on the field. You know, we need people who are you know, really, really passionate about doing a great job. And, and, they, uh, and that sort of flows, flows into driven. You know, we want to we get better on a daily basis. And that's something that we need to continue to do, continually improve and, and continually uh, uh, climb the ladder as such. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not sure if Chris Rose is going to be overly happy with you because I think he was quite excited about the uh, <laughs> some some subtle things in 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 around the shirts. But the, the shirts are really exciting. I, I believe they're going to be launched in, in in. Actually, I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to announce that, but hopefully very soon. Don't put dates uh, on things because when you put okay. dates on things, it becomes a whole story. That's why I reversed out. Of that. <laughs> That's why I reversed out. Um, but I believe it's going to be this month, and and yeah, really exciting. Um, you know, we've got a, a traditional style shirt and we've got a, an away one, which is... Going change to, kit. A change kit, which is going to be... Um, Brilliant. It'll be Marmite, I think. I, I think um, some people will really dislike it. Some people will love it. Um, some people will talk about it. Um, but it's, um, it's certainly one that grows on you. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. I don't care what anyone says. It's brilliant. I, and I think they're going to love it. I, you mentioned it, so I'm going to ask you. 1993 Pilkington Cup final on LTTV this Saturday, 3 p.m. Obviously, Dossa Smith, uh, it was actually an emotional preview from Dossa because we talked about Tudor Thomas, we talked about Dave Matthews, Thomas Crumby. He shared his thoughts on the club and what it means to him. And if anyone hasn't heard Dossa Smith speak, if Darren Garforth is the most entertaining Tiger ever, then Dossa Smith is the most emotional Tiger ever which sometimes you get labelled with, and I'm sure his son, Matt Smith, has been labelled with before as well. But 1993, what do you remember of that team? Because you were probably still running around playing Gaelic football at that point. I was. Um, I think I remember watching that TV in, in our game on TV. I would have been about 14 at the time. Um, I have seen highlights of it since. And, and uh, a lot of what I remember from that game is what people have talked about. Um, Martin Johnson recently uh, recanted his his story of of how the the famous try that took place from the tap penalty took uh, happened and and just to hear him talking about it in such passion and I think they that that was a one of the things that stuck with me actually the the the, the little, he got a little glass tankard on the on the back of a uh, on the on the back of um winning the ninety three Pilkington Cup which his son broke about four weeks ago oh no so he wasn't very happy about that that's why he. He started telling the story, but like you know, some some great legends, Leicester legends, um, Dino and and Cockers and Garf. The ABC club would have been kind of in its infancy, and obviously we spoke to the Garf last week, and he talked about that. Um, but just to see John, a young John, and a young Dino out there, see a, a young Tony Spreadbury 
um, refereeing w was interesting. I, I sent him a clip uh, recently of, of, of a five meter mall where um, I think it was Richard Cockrell got stamped on by, by the second row and, and the penalty went against Leicester. So I sent him the clip and asked him how did he miss the stamp? But he, um, oh, stan standard referee, had, a, uh, had an excuse for missing it. So I, um, that was all right. I think you should really try and stay out of spread as bad books as much as you can. Uh, the, the, awesome. thing that people, the, the people that people don't understand is that myself and Tony are best buddies. We, um, <laughs> we have calls on a weekly basis and we get on great. Um, the, the, the Geordie who isn't 90 minutes either side of the game is a very different person than I am the other, uh, uh, the other six, six and a half days of the week. What's important to note too, and Dossa revealed it, is Jono missed the bus for that final. So he may not have actually played the game. And in the days when you didn't have mobile phones and WhatsApp to say, where are you? They just had to hope and pray he turned up at the hotel in London. Yeah, it's, it's amazing what happened in those days. You know, there, there's stories of other players. Um, Jamie Hamilton, who went on to play a lot of rugby as, as a nine for Leicester, got his debut on, on, on the wing at Bath when they, uh, one of the Underwood boys got stuck in traffic and, and, and couldn't get out. And obviously, we didn't have an extensive squad. So he ended up playing on the wing and went on to, to playing a lot for Tigers. So... Um, slightly different these days, but in the uh, in the nineties, it was a uh, very much you know just make your own way there, and and the uh, the amateur era was still in full swing. Well, Tudor Thomas noticed apparently after the bus had left, so uh, it's certainly not like it is now, where there's someone at the door going, "All right, you're here, you're here, hands up if you're not here." I guess is the old adage, isn't it? Which other nine? Which Tigers nine made his international debut on the wing? Austin Healy. No, oh, Ben Youngs. Did he make his debut on the wing? Yeah, against Scotland, wasn't it? Gosh, I hope I'm right now. Uh, Austin Healy is a winger. Gosh, he's not going to be happy I've said that. I don't know. It might, might have been Austin. I don't know when Austin, if Austin was capped on the winger at nine first, to be quite honest. Well, I guess, Geordie, that, as I said, a long week, a week in which people have probably got more than they want to see my face, certainly. Um, but without being rude, probably more than they want to see yours at times too. Uh, next week, Harjin to sing. That's I'm quite excited about that. I'm going to do some medical research in the build up to try and catch him out. Do yourself a favour and don't. You won't be able to. <laughs> Bloke is a genius. He's um, good, isn't he? He's very very good. Um, but I uh, no Haj is a uh, he's a great man and a, uh, yeah I'm excited about next week. I'm sure people are very sick of me. We might need to we might need to replace me as a co-host soon, do you? Or am I still a uh, cut in the mustard? I think it was a ten episode contract, so you've you, got you, two more in you. You forgot as well. You, you forgot. Look, I changed. I changed my uh, my table for you today. Oh, you did. I've you come did. back to where I was. You've come back to what you know, and you've you've stripped out some of the uh, uh, you've stripped out some of the stuff, and finally managed to op open the top of that gin as well. So well done, you. And I'm branded up today, oh, for no particular yeah. reason other than it was a little bit cold. And I'm not. No, that's you're you're looking like Yan McGinnity. That's, uh, that's how we roll. That's how we roll. That's how we roll. But as I said, I guess what I will say is, if if fans do have any questions to ask the club doctor. Send them in because we will only come up with a certain amount and we might nause him. You might even put him under some pressure to relax some stuff so that you can get the boys back out there training. But um, if you do have a question about the medical side of how you return from COVID, send it in because it will be quite interesting to see what Harj has to say on them all. And as I say, I want to catch him out. I really want to catch him out on something. So Brilliant. we'll see Brilliant. how we go. But Geordie, I appreciate your time. It's been a very long week. It's, it's an emotional time at Tigers for you know, all jokes aside, and you guys continue to front up. So go and enjoy. I think it's around bath time, isn't it, now, and you're on duty? Well, if you heard any screaming, it's because the kids were in the bath. Um, hopefully you haven't. My, um, my poor wife is, is, a, uh, is fit to a pass out. So it's been a long day. It's been a long week. And I, uh, I think I'm going to have a glass of wine to myself. I actually meant it was bath time for you, but that's fine. <laughs> Thanks for the story. Anyway, I will see you again next week. Cheers, mate. Thank you, Jordan. <laughs>